Um, Brent Hilscher, process engineering for the last 15 years. Um, Placer Dome, Imperial Metals, um, some time at Syncrude, Hatch, and now I'm at Sacred Avi, um, leading the mining group. We're doing a lot of um, ore sorting work, a lot of pre-crushing work, and a lot of updating the economics of feasibility studies with, um, with, with the changes that ore sorting makes to those studies. So today we're going to talk about sensor-based ore sorting and the change that has on projects, project economics. <coughs> Ten years ago, this was a pretty innovative, cutting-edge technology. Um, today, it's been proven in every metal and every um, type of mining application. Um, and there's well over 50 mines using this. Um, some say over 100. But, um, so it's, it's too late to be the first, which is fine, because mining usually likes to have a bit of a race to be second to adopt a technology. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's too late to be second, but it's still time to be 51st. Um, so we're going to look at the <coughs> economic and technical impact that ore sorting has had on some of our uh, clients' deposits. Um, we've seen uh, Projects with a rate of return too low to attract investment get changed into um, very fundable projects. Um, mines that were losing money got turned around and now they're going to be one of the most profitable mines in their, the company's portfolio. Um, and the uh, last ten, 10 years have seen dozens of really amazing ore sorting projects happen. Um, most have been kept confidential because Companies often see it as a competitive advantage for acquisitions and operations, which is completely fair. I'd do the same thing if I were them. Um, so we really appreciate these four companies have, who have let us share some of their information. So ore sorting is now at a level of development that most engineers are surprised by. This is a, an example of an x-ray sorter. The, the rocks travel under the x-ray, are instantaneously assessed and tracked. Each particle as it leaves the end of the belt is hit by an air jet to divert it or let fall into the regular bin. Usually you divert whatever the less, lesser amount is. The, amount, the uh, stuff on the left there is about 15% of the mass and that's the ore in this case. So that was diverted by air jet to save on air. Um, so this company was able to eliminate 85% of their ore because 85% of their ore was not ore, it was waste. And they were losing money on every rock. Um, the great news for them is 15% of their ore made all that waste rock collectively into ore. Um, throwing away the waste rock meant they made an awful lot more money by just processing the high grade. Um, also, it allowed them to no longer be mill limited. Um, so they were able to, I think, more than double their metal production and still have <coughs> save on power and labor and maintenance. <laughs> so here's uh, <coughs> some of the operations. Um, this isn't by any means a comprehensive list. This is just some of our favorites. Um, this is the, the sort of the new wave, the renaissance of ore sorting equipment. These are the high tonnage units. They are um, um, typically their x-ray, um, x-ray transmission, x-ray fluorescence. Um, there are still you know, color and laser and things like that. Um, but uh, the x-ray suite seems to be grabbing a larger market share every year. <laughs> also, this list is focused on hard rock mining, base metals, precious metals. Um, we could probably double it if we were to include industrial minerals and things like that. Any comment on the regionality? Like Russia is very big. Oh, yeah, and that's only uh, a fraction of Russia's um, total. Um, in terms of ore sorting, I'd bet Russia is the world leader. Um, I haven't done a study, but it looks like most of their operations, for gold at least, use it. 
and they tend to use XRF. Yeah. Brent, good to see you again. Yeah. Um, we're sitting in Canada, and obviously Canada's quite thin on that list. Any thoughts about uh, why we're not taking this technology up? So why isn't Canada on the list is the question. Answer is mining is slow to adopt new technologies. Um, Canada will be on the list. We're actually building one right now in British Columbia, a gold mine. Um, full-scale production unit. It'll be finished by the end of the year for sure. Um, so then we can set up tours for anyone who wants to go visit. Yeah. The driving force for this, is it, is it mining techniques and dilution or is it the nature of the ore body? It's both. So the question is, is it dilution or is it internal to the ore body? Mainly we focus on the uh, ore body. So set aside dilution. We look at the ore and how variable is that ore? How many waste rocks are in that ore? Um, dilution is a nice little bonus for this business case because if you can sort the ore from itself, the dilution is even easier because it has much different characteristics and typically even lower grades, so it's a very sharp separation. So hopefully we'll add some Canadian gold by the end of the year, and uh, also some Mexican silver too. So some clarity is Sacredavy is not an equipment supplier. We don't make equipment. We don't sell equipment. Um, we're an engineering company. We manage the testing, the design, um, EPCM, and sometimes EPC if it's less than 100 million. Um, and we, of course, we look at all the technologies. So we work with all vendors, there's over 10 of them, um, Steinert, Tomra, MindSense, Red Wave, um, Rados, um, and they are, they're all very good. They've all been advancing very, very quickly. Um, a lot of them have doubled their tonnage every two years. Um, so it, it's very much a matching the right sensor and the right manufacturer with a specific project geology. And you can't say, well, this, this gold mine worked with this sensor, so this one will too. You, sometimes that happens, but it's almost always a coincidence. You've got to do the test work. So that's where we come in. So it depends on the sensor? It depends on the geology. So what is the gold associated with it? The, uh, the geology oh, dictates the, the sensor. Yeah. <coughs> and the cost? The cost? Cost varies dramatically. Um, XRF is one of the most expensive. Um, optical is one of the cheapest. Um, it's pretty tough to say. Usually the cost is of this, the equipment itself is pretty <coughs> insignificant compared to the total cost of the project, which is usually fairly insignificant compared to the revenue increase. Um, usually we ha shoot for about a four to six month payback on a brownfield expansion. Um, if we're doing a greenfield project, um, we don't need to worry about payback because putting in ore sorting allows for a smaller mill and then you save on your total capex so it's not an issue then. So mining's faced some pretty real challenges in the last few years. Uh, we've got declining ore grades, increasing energy costs, labor costs, some stagnant metal prices in cases. Um, investors are only now investing in projects with uh, very high rates of return. This makes uh, greenfield projects a little more challenging. And uh, brownfield operations are also feeling the pressure to um, increase revenue without spending dramatic amounts of capex. <coughs> but if we can improve the mill feed grade. Um, a typical result we see is we double it. So if we can double the mill feed grade, um, these challenges start to become much more manageable. You can have your unit energy costs, have your labor cost, have your tailings pond size relative to metal production. Um, these, these are all really game-changing concepts. Um, and, and the best of all is if you've already got your mill built, and you double your mill feed grade, you can double your revenue. 
And so that's not doubling your profit. You can double the revenue. Um, so all that extra revenue just adds to your profit. Um, so it can be quite dramatic. Grant, can you yeah. apply this to heat bleach? Generally, we don't. Um, heat bleach grades tend to be so low that it starts to get tricky, whether it's worth the extra, well, it's an extra dollar a ton. Um, You're shorting for a dollar a ton? Hmm? You are shorting for a yeah. dollar a ton? That's right. Um, plus handling charges, so that might be another, that depends on the operation and tonnage, but might be another dollar a ton. It might be a convenient place to put into an existing conveyor and it's almost nothing, or you're building a whole sorting plant, it's 50 million bucks for your plant, you know, it depends on geometry. Not the way we build them, but yeah, it could be, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, we have looked at heap leaches before. Typically the opportunity is you've got bimodal distribution of gold grades, so most of the ore deserves to go to the heap leach, but then there's a percentage of ore that has different characteristics and would be worth milling if you had a way of diverting it. And an ore sorter can be an excellent way of doing that. And diverting that high grade, um, anything over two or three grams per ton, um, to a, a special processing facility. Do you do that, for example, separating the sulfide from the oxide? Yes. That's been done. Um, it's tricky, um, but it's been done. Yeah. One dollar a ton. Uh, you, uh, I don't quite understand it. If you're going to double your your yield or your production <coughs> of gold, uh, then don't you have to double your mining rate? Yeah. 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 Your mining rate is less than a dollar a ton, including the sorting. Oh my no. No, no, this is just the well, sorting you costs. Said you can double your revenue. Oh, if you want a whole project cost thing, I'll, ha I'll have to charge you for that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it gets complicated if you're underground. A lot of times, well, I'm uh, talking, I'm just open pit. The question from Bob or, uh, or Rob that, uh, about using heat leach. Ah, heat leach, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the price will go up. I, um, is it actually an operation where this is being done? Oh, you can yeah, yeah. Between heat leaching and uh, uh, risk or without ore sorting? Let's see. I've got some waste, a lot of waste rock. Um, There's rock already done in mine. Yeah, these, these are all, they mine the rock and then they either take the waste, sort the waste, or they take the ore and sort they the charge, ore. Do not charge except for reclaiming the rock. Yes. Presumably, this is all the, all the rock. Previously, mined rock, which has been written off. You could. That's called waste sorting. Oh, no, no, no. So you can take the waste, sort your waste piles, take the high grade out of that. That's very common. You can also take your live ore, intercept it after your gyratory, and process it on the way to the mill. And they're both very good applications. The costs are very dictate the choices. Yes. Much more. Yep. You said the sensor doesn't. Sensor doesn't isn't more than ten percent of the cost. It's the it's the sorting of the belt, the, the cost of the air compressor, that is seventy yep. percent of the cost. Yeah, that's why you get up to a dollar a ton. Otherwise, it'd be ten cents a ton. Um, but that air, you know, it's expensive. Um, although the cost of the air compressor is, it pales in comparison to the cost of your sag mill and your ball mills. Um, so if you can divert half of your ore, and it costs a dollar a ton to do that, you save a lot of money still. Yeah. Um, each, well it depends. You've got a, a suite of different technologies, and we deal with all of them. Um, so we do screening and heavy media. That's not really covered here, but you've got almost unlimited tonnage with those. You've got the mine sense technology, which is shovel based. Again, that's almost as, as you scoop, it goes. Um, you've got conveyor diverters, unlimited. Um, unlimited. Um, not these conveyor diverters, these are rock by rock. So the conveyors we're talking about is a, a standard conveyor piled deep with rocks, finds the whole mix, 
and you scan through the entire belt using uh, prompt neutron activation, something like that, um, and divert all of it at once. It's not very selective, but it is incredibly high tonnage. Once you get into things like the video we saw, rock by rock diversion, your limit's about 300 tons per hour, theoretical maximum, per machine. Per machine. Per machine. Um, we've got one client was going to do 200,000 tons per day. So that requires a 32 pack, approximately. Um, it's also very sensitive to the technology that's used and the size distribution of the rocks. The finer the rocks, the less capacity each machine will have. Okay, thank you, thank you. Oh, no problem. Mm. So, it's a bit of a Swiss Army knife. It can do a lot of different things, not necessarily all at the same time, though. Um, it can increase the mill feed grade. It can increase the resource by lowering the cutoff grade for the mine. It can take waste and turn that into ore, which is basically the same thing as lowering the cutoff grade. Um, it can take old waste piles and create ore out of them. Um, the fastest payback business cases are usually sorting the mill feed because um, double the revenue and everything is happy. Um, but there are a lot of other things it can do. We're also building a project right now that is looking into um, sorting sulfides out of a waste pile so they can produce non-acid generating waste piles. That'd be nice. Well, also in Europe, this is uh, very important. Yeah. Uh, that's why you find far more <coughs> in the industrial mineral than yeah. in the metallic mines. Yeah. And even more so in recycling, which is where recycling. the current suite the of technologies have come from. Yeah. So a lot of this comes down to heterogeneity. How variable is the ore zone? Um, a lot of projects say, oh, no, no, our, our block models, all the grades are the same. Um, we've looked at projects like that where the blocks are indeed very, very similar to each other. There's not a lot of natural variation in those. Um, but when you get down to the four inch level, there's tremendous variation. And you look at the distribution of the ore grade and half of the rocks in that uniform ore body are far enough below cutoff grade that the mill loses money when they process them. Yeah? Yeah, Chris, um, this is a very good point. Has this technology been applied into, say, metallurgical testing at the preliminary economic uh, assessment stage or PC? Yep. And build into models? Yep. What are the examples tend to be first build? Yep, yep. That's, that's what we're doing now. Um, so we've had about 10 projects where we've taken um, the test work and incorporated it into a design and a, into a new feasibility study. Well, buying a model that, that allows you to insert or sorting in, 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 a, in a mine layout or build, building, uh, building a mine, there is uh, The industry hasn't produced that yet. Yep. And, and do you ever do a so the question was, do we compare to DMS? Um, yep, we've done quite a few comparisons. Uh, do the metallurgist uh, acronym for DMS is? Dense media cyclones. Okay, thanks. And actually, I'll talk a about that a little bit in the XRT section. But um, so we look at DMS as uh, complementary technology. Or sorting works down to half inch is pretty much the limit. You can go a little finer, but the machine costs start to exponentially increase. Um, but that's right around where dense media cyclones start to pick up in effectiveness. So we will look at this and say, all right, it's sortable by XRT. 
we'll take the course material, sort it by XRT. It's more selective because it doesn't look at the average particle density, it looks at the density profile. So the average density could be low, but 5% of that rock might be in the target density profile range. And the sensor can say, well, yeah, it's a low density rock, but 5% here, this little crescent, looks like ore. And we know that ore is valuable enough to make that whole rock worth processing, so they'll take that whole rock and send it to the ore bin. Whereas uh, DMS can't do that. I've just changed the rules. Uh, a, lot of his, a lot of your questions will be answered in this presentation, so let's go ahead and get a little <coughs> and then we'll see if it doesn't cover. <coughs> <coughs> And sorry for the coughing. Um, the doctor says it's not contagious, so you're all safe. Um, so don't feel bad about not knowing the heterogeneity of your deposit. No one's ever measured it at the four inch scale before because it's never mattered before. There's been nothing useful you could do with that information before, um, but now there is. So now we're starting to measure this. Um, and the more variable your uh, rocks, the higher the potential for ore sorting. The higher grade and lower grade, the better the potential. If we can throw away rocks that are absolutely barren, that's the best case scenario. So this is the state of the art here. This is um, actually in Japan. They still do hand sorting. Um, it's one of the rare cases where Russia is ahead of Japan in technology. Um, below is the 32-pack um, that we're thinking about for one of our clients who needs, uh, they have an open pit, 200,000 tons per day. But usually you'd look at that and say, okay, well, let's try mine sense in the conveyor sorting. But in this case, rock by rock sorting was very, very effective. And their ore is valuable enough that it's worth sorting rock by rock in order to maintain that very high recovery and also have, produce a very high concentrate grade. And uh, in this case, they saved, I think it was $600 million <coughs> by spending the extra bit for the ore sorting plant and then making their mill half the size. All right, so here we get into the technical part of the presentation. XRT is uh, usually dual energy X-ray transmission that compensates for the size of the rock and gives you the density reading instead of just the absorbs absorption of it. Um, it's able to measure the density profile, which is wonderful because you're not just looking at the average you're looking at a statistical distribution of density in that rock. Um, of course, this is all happening to hundreds of rocks at the same time, but processing power is now more than up to the challenge. Ten years ago, it wasn't, um, which is probably why in the 90s these machines were focused on diamonds and small tonnage operations and things like that. Here's a video of my last trip to Germany. Um, Steinert and Tomra both have manufacturing and labs there. This was taken with my iPhone. And I think this lies. This is an XRT. This is actually laser sorting. Very noisy, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, not sag mill noisy, but noisy enough. Um, with this model, we were looking at taking some rubber belting and bolting it to the back wall. Most of the noise is from the rocks being projected into the steel plate and then dropping down. Yeah. Um, in this case, the aura represented 35% of the feed. It was a silver project we were working on for one of our clients. Um, 
and you see it, this has no problem dealing with high speeds. This is moving at uh, over 2 meters per second. I think it's 2.6 meters per second, um, which is how they achieve the tonnages of 200 tons per hour. Oh, the difference between is pretty huge. Usually we look at the difference between the feed and the final product. Um, in this case, it was about triple, um, which is a little out of the ordinary. Usually double is what we shoot for. Anything over 25% uh, mill feed upgrade is considered a success, assuming you don't lose too much metal in doing that. I wouldn't remember that number because every deposit is completely different. Yeah. Um, if you have really tall amount, that's what you get. Yeah, yeah. How tall is a building? Well, they average this, but it's not very helpful. Um, so your question was? Recovery. Recovery? Again, that varies. Okay. Well, this might be a good time for the recovery. Um, so that's based on the economic model. You can't say what the best recovery is or what the best upgrade ratio is based on gut feeling. You have to have all the mine, capex, opex, the mill, capex, opex, put it all into a very simple economic model so that you can also input the grade recovery curves and try a few scenarios. And then you can go to them and say, look, 90% recovery is what we want. Oh, but you can get 97. We can get 97, but 90 is the best because here's your upgrade ratio. You're throwing away more worthless rocks and this is going to get you your best rate of return and best net present value, and that's why you want to do that. That's the same as any grade recovery yeah. analysis that we do. Mass pool on your plantation is the same yeah. analysis. Yeah. And then uh, we can say, look, you know, we can get you your recovery higher again. How much money do you want to waste processing rocks to boost your recovery statistics? And usually they'll say, oh, no, 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 it's fine. Leave it the way it is. So in some instances, density of individual rocks might not be helpful in sorting. Um, a lot of times if you're, you're dealing with a medium density material, you might have barite in your ore, which is very heavy. Um, trying to s separate sulfides from quartz and barite can be tricky because a little bit of quartz mixed with a little bit of barite sometimes looks like sulfides. Um, in those cases, XRF is incredibly handy. Um, it gives us a surface scan of the material, kind of like an assay. It'll give you a number of counts, and that'll let you determine your um, metal content in the ore. It's surprisingly accurate. Um, very rarely do we find copper hiding in the middle of the rock somehow. Um, usually the scan will show um, uh, a reading, and it's usually well within uh, the um, statistical error that we need to determine is this rock worth throwing away or is it worth keeping? <coughs> and errors made are usually errors made with those marginal rocks that might be worth a tiny bit if you processed, but if you lose them, no one's too upset by that. This is an example of a, uh, um, let's see, this is a, yeah, gold mine that used copper, zinc, titanium, and iron as indicators of the presence of gold. So we don't scan for gold directly. No one does yet. Um, but that has never been a problem with most of the operations yet because it's, gold doesn't get deposited by itself. It always takes other things with it. In this case, copper, zinc, titanium, and iron. Um, also, a lot of times we'll find negative correlations. So zirconium might be in the waste rock and not in the gold bearing rock, in which case we can use that as a negative correlation just as easily. So in this case, it says, ah, this has uh, four grams per ton. It's worth $160 per ton. Therefore, it's ore and we keep it. Color, infrared, ultraviolet, all very common uh, technologies too. They require a clean rock. Electromagnetic, um, haven't quite found a, tech, uh, a deposit that needs this yet. Um, if you've got um, magnetite associations, uh, if you've got um, coherent veins of pyrotite, it might be handy. Um, we've tested it a few times, though. 
getting into the cutting edge now, if people really did want to be on the cutting edge, <coughs> we have laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy. So we shoot a high-powered laser at the rock, vaporize some of it, superheat the vaporized rock into plasma, and then as it cools, we look at the spectrum and it gives us our, our metal content. Well, uh, not just metals, it gives us all the elements. So um, very handy if you've got a lithium mine and you don't want to use a color sorter, uh, you would be able to measure it directly. Um, might be a couple years away from production yet, though. So this is the, the MindSense technology, which is um, fairly new still. Um, there have been a, a few places around the world that have tested this, and the results seem to be quite positive. Um, as the ore falls into the bucket, the sensor sweeps it. So it's not point analysis, it's a sweep. Takes the average, and a little red light or a green light pops up on their dashboard saying, this bucket is ore, this one is waste. Um, you can then put it into a ore truck or a waste truck. Alternately, you could use the same truck as you always use and average the three scoops that go into that truck and say, all right, this truck is now going to the waste pile. Um, it would be very handy, <coughs> especially to have on the trucks that were um, scooping up waste. Because every now and then, everyone knows, you get a couple pockets of good stuff in your waste piles. Um, if that truck could be diverted to the mill, that, that would be a significant amount of metal. And yeah, it would be basically free. <coughs> so the 80-20 rule applies to many of the existing waste piles. 20% uh, of the rocks often contain 80% of the metal. Sometimes it's 90 to 10. Um, by removing the the fraction of valuable rocks, um, you can often create a, uh, an ore that's much, much higher than your feed grade. The limit is the geology. There is no real uplift ratio limit to ore sorting. It depends on what are the grades of the good rocks once you take away everything else. And once you start processing your waste piles or waste stopes for profit, the geologists like to turn those into resources, and that makes everyone happy. These are some of the uh, suppliers and labs we work with. Um, Rados are the ones in, in Russia. They've got a very, very sensitive machine, um, very accurate. Steinert, uh, Tamra make very large machines, able to sort rock by rock. MindSense, of course, has the um, shovel. And then there's a, a number of others, uh, Red Wave and uh, various conveyor belt diversion sorting mechanisms um, and things like that. And it's, it's nice being an engineering company because we can deal with all of them and pick which one is right for a specific deposit. This is typically how we'll configure the, the flow sheet. Um, it's nice to have a gyratory first. It's not absolutely required. What is required is getting in the right screen size range. So half inch to four inch tends to be the sortable rock by rock range. Um, if you're going with um, conveyor diversions or shovel, of course this wouldn't apply. This is just for the rock by rock. So you get your size fraction. You send that to the ore sorter. That rejects and then the fines and the uh, or sort of product are recombined and sent to the mill. If you've got a high tonnage operation, more than 300 tons per hour, it often makes sense to put in um, a couple ore sorters and then differentiate, have one on um, a finer fraction and one on a coarser fraction. <coughs> Anything you can do to keep that um, particle size distribution ratios as tight as you can. All right, so here's some of the examples we promised. Operation A is an example of waste sorting. Here we're able to get 63% uh, of the waste metal into uh, an ore grade above cutoff. <coughs> <coughs> With waste sorting, we usually like to see a 5 to 1 to 10 to 1 upgrade ratio. Um, 
because of course you're starting with waste. Um, but in this case, the geology wasn't really cooperating. Um, nevertheless, we did create ore out of a waste pile. And after our, we did all the expenses, um, capex, opex, uh, looks like the ore produced would pay off the sorting capital expenses in about 12 months, which is not usually what we like to see. We usually like to see six months, because in today's capital market, most major companies say, if we give you a dollar in January, we want $2 by December. And, uh, and usually that's achievable. This wasn't the, the best example. Um, but we wanted to show the whole range. So some of the other examples will be a little more impressive. So this was an American underground silver mine where we needed to take a fairly high grade silver ore and upgrade it sufficiently to justify trucking it a long distance to be toll mined. So very small tonnage. Um, the sorting algorithm used zinc, iron, titanium, and zirconium. Um, to predict the silver grades. We tried a few different cutoff grades for the ore sorting equipment. We got a 40% boost in ore grade for just about a 1% loss of recovery, which is very nice. Um, if we took a 20% loss in silver, that led to a 300% increase. Uh, this was our first ore sorting project, so we didn't actually build the economic model. So we weren't able to recommend which of these scenarios was the right one for them. Um, we learned our lesson there, so now we always do an economic model with every um, project. Otherwise, how do you say which of these is the right one? Um, and if we went all the way to uh, the top 5% of rocks, 46% of the silver was contained in just 5 out of 100 rocks. And. Uh, Although we didn't do the project economics for this one, these guys' stock has tripled since this report came out, so they seem to be doing just fine. You promised that with every company? <laughs> <laughs> I do not promise that. All right, so this was a, a large US-based polymetallic project. They needed to boost their rate of return to boost investor interest. Um, they also needed to cut their capex to make it uh, the investment size a little more reasonable. Um, by rejecting half of the mill um, feed, the, um, the mill size was halved. So all the capex associated with the mill was reduced by the appropriate percentage. You can't half the capex, but significantly less. I think it was around 40% less. Um, also the tailings pond was halved. Half the tonnage going through the mill means your tailings pond is half, and that was a huge, huge cost for them. Um, in the end, even though I think this cost around $100 million to set up the ore sorting plant, they saved $700 million in other costs, and I think they increased their um, metal production a little bit. Um, also, they were able to do reduce their production costs, because now smaller mill, uh, less power, less reagents, less everything. Um, no. And mine D, this was a silver mine slated to be shut down. Um, they had far too much um, dilution, except it wasn't actually dilution. Their, their ore blocks, when you did the scan, um, what was that, around 80% of them were um, worthless. So they were losing money on most of the rocks that were going into their mill. Um, so it was very easy. We say, well, stop processing all those rocks and you'll stop losing money. Um, this mine is now set to become very profitable and uh, they're very, very happy. The mine is going to have to do a little work to catch up now because the mill is uh, saying, OK, can you quadruple our feed rate? And the mine's saying, no, no, we can't. We can maybe double it. Um, but still, if the mine can double their production, now you've got twice as much silver, and the mill's still underfed. Um, so you either run at reduced capacity, shut down one of the circuits, um, save on power, save on labor. It's, it's still a definite, definite win for them. Uh, their profit went from minus 3 million to somewhere in the 50 million range. 
Here's a bonus slide with some uh, a gold mine that we did and uh, Kensington Mine. I can mention the name because it's not one of my clients and their information is public. They did a waste sorting project <coughs> where they increased their um, waste pile grade almost ten times, about eight times it looks like, and produced a fairly clean uh, waste pile. 61% recovery, not terribly impressive until you look at the upgrade ratio and the amount of money that they're making on that waste pile. And then that is actually pretty impressive. Um, they took something that was worthless and now they're making money on 61% of it. All right, just wrapping up here. How we usually test this, um, every site is different. All the results at every site are always, always different. You can't say, ah, the guys down the road got this result, so will we. It never works that way. Each site needs specific testing. Um, typically, we'll do 100 rocks per deposit for a scoping study. Um, Pre-fees will be 100 rocks per zone, especially if the zones have differences in gold associations at all. Um, rock by rock analysis is very, very important. It, especially with um, gold, platinum, uh, silver, you want to have the association and the algorithm between all your indication readings, be it XRT, XRF, color laser, and the gold content. So if a, and then you can do simulations on what the sorter would have done. Um, once you've got, you can also put it into your economic model with those grade recovery curves. Once you've built the economic models, you take the best economic models, put them into the um, bulk sorting stage where you prove them using a more representative sample. Um, that takes us to uh, feasibility level of design. Um, usually people avoid the pilot plant because it'll often cost almost as much as a full plant. Um, but 50 tons can be tested easily enough in most of the labs. So that's most of the lab equipment is full-scale equipment. So, conclusions. Or sorting is now a very proven technology. You don't have to worry about being cutting edge with most of these technologies. It's too late for that. It's been proven all around the world. Um, there are still emerging technologies that if you do want to be on the cutting edge, there's, there's quite a few of them. LIBS is a good example of that. Um, or sorting can reduce your haulage, um, lengthen mine life by pulling ore out of waste piles and lowering mine cutoff grades. Uh, sorting revitalizes greenfield projects by reducing the capex and opex. Um, <coughs> um, besides reducing capital and operating costs, it also um, reduces the environmental footprint. So your CO2 footprint, your water usage, your tailings ponds are all reduced. Um, that has a definite benefit with government and community relations, which shouldn't be underestimated. Um, if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them now or after the rest of the talks.